Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Hope for Our Planet session, which brings to an end our Stories of Hope series and Earth Optimism 2021. This whole event has been a celebration of conservation success stories from around the globe and also how positive action can lead to real change when it comes to securing a brighter, better future for our species and for the planet. And I can't think of a better way uh, to end this series than with a conversation with the undisputed voice of our planet, a broadcaster with a lifetime's experience of the natural world, the inimitable Sir David Attenborough. David, it's lovely to see you as always. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Uh, this entire 10 days has been a celebration, hasn't it, of, of conservation success stories. And throughout your career, you have worked with so many conservationists. How have you seen their approach to saving the planet, habitats and species change over that time? The shift in my lifetime since the 1950s um, has been from looking away from a um, particular species um, and saying, uh, no, that, that's not what we have to say. They are just indicators. They may be useful in terms of raising money and getting public interest in something, you know, gorillas or chimps or whatever. Um, but what we are really talking about is the whole community, the ecosystem, because that's what these rare animals depend upon. And without the, uh, a vibrant and healthy ecosystem, they're lost. Um, so uh, the shift in my lifetime, which is going back to what you asked me, um, is from a single charismatic species that we've got to save to realizing that what we have to save is ecosystems. And the change that has happened within the last few years is a, recognition, is a recognition that, that actually it's not just ecosystems that we're dealing with. It's the planet. Um, the, the notion that the realization that the health of the planet depends upon the great ecosystem, and the obvious one of which, of course, is the Amazon rainforest. The recognition that what happens so the rainforest, which is which is a, a key in the circulation um, of, of the atmospheric circulation of the globe, will affect all the globe. And if you destroy that, you destroy the whole of this system, which has been built up over millions of years. Our, our understanding continues to evolve and grow, which is exciting and fascinating for, for people like ourselves who are learning from these conservationists. And planetary health is now this what we, we, we're calling it a new discipline, this understanding that we are inextricably linked to the health of the planet. And it's only about a decade old. And yet, indigenous people have always known, they, they've never forgotten how deeply connected we are to nature and how much we rely on it. They, they speak of nature as a, as a gift that we must take care of and, and respect greatly. What do you think about that disconnect between the West's knowledge, even though it's improving, and the fact that in, in, Indigenous people are those disproportionately affected by the way we're living on the, in the world, and yet they, they, they have such treasures of knowledge, don't they, about how we really are supposed to live on this planet? We have to relearn uh, what it means to, to be part of an ecosystem, just as it isn't relearning now uh, is the problem now, it's learning for the first time that it's not we're a member of, an, of a particular ecosystem. We are all members of one enormous, gigantic, interconnected ecosystem. And that's going to take uh, a, a new educational, uh, a new education for ourselves, uh, a new attitude towards recognizing that what you do here um, on the shores of Britain is going to have an effect on the other side of the Atlantic or farther. Mm. And that what we pump into the air uh, is, is going to have an effect worldwide, planet-wide. And thus, we, all the old systems of nationalism have got to change to take account of it. The importance of community, of a shared humanity, that we are we are nature and we all have to work together. That's a big challenge, isn't it? And uh, speaking of challenges, 
how do you compare what conservationists today have to do and are up against compared to the likes of Sir Peter Scott, who you knew very well and who perhaps our younger viewers may not have heard of? Well, let me speak of, of, of Sir Peter. Uh, he was um, the outstanding, in my, in my world, the outstanding naturalist. Uh, he was, of course, a, a marvellous wildlife painter. Um, and his pictures of, of, of geese in sunset, people say, oh, yes, they're conventional. But they are fantastic. And if you've actually seen geese in the, in the sunset, you know that Peter caught it. And, and, and if you value that, you value P Peter's paintings. <coughs> but he was um, also a marvellous naturalist. We're celebrating su conservation success stories uh, for the past 10 days. And I want to ask you, are there any conservation success stories that have stayed with you throughout your career that really uh, inspired you and influenced your work going forward, whether it comes to a particular species or a habitat? What has stayed with you most strongly? Well, if we're talking about individual species, um, I think Jane Goodall, did a, a, a marvelous thing. Uh, I mean, she, uh, when she was, well, I'm not sure whether she was in her teens, but she wasn't, she was in her early twenties. And, and uh, a young girl in England who decided that she was going to go and study chimpanzees in the world by herself. Um, and, and did so. Uh, and then it became apparent that these, very intelligent creatures, the chimps, had accepted her um, and, and treated her as though she was, she was one of them. Uh, and her observations changed the attitude, I think, of the nation and, and beyond uh, to the relationship that could exist between a human being and a perfectly wild animal society. And she became one of them, and she has never stopped. Um, I, her, it's very difficult to see her because she lives on aeroplanes, as far as I can make out. And because she, she travels continuously, preaching the message uh, in a in a most extraordinary, powerful way. We, us mere mortals, speak about you and Jane Goodall in that regard. The amount of work and dedication you both have applied to to what is both your passions is extraordinary. We don't understand how you have so much energy to do what you do, but I presume it's the it's the magic of nature that you've been surrounding yourself with your entire life that keeps you going. It has to be. We can see it in your eyes when you speak about nature, Sir David. <laughs> the I. I, I, I get so much credit for things that don't belong to me or that I haven't earned. Um, I mean, uh, it's, in the early days, I, I was out there making the films, directing the camera and one thing or another. Uh, these days, the natural history films that, that people see and, uh, and are moved by are the part of big teams. I mean, there could have been as many as 30 cameramen or camera persons because they're women as well as men. Um, uh, who contribute to these amazing films um, and who and then they're the editors who, who sift it and get out the great shots and put them together in such a way. And I come in at the end of them and supply the words. And, and everybody thinks that because it's my words that I describe an extraordinary happening um, that may have taken several years to, to, to film by a, camera, by a group of cameramen even. Uh, and they think, they say to me, following day, what was it like when you went when you that way or did that? And I say, well, I wasn't there. What? I said, I wasn't there. It was, a, it was a cameraman who did it maybe uh, two years ago. And I just put words on him. Uh, and there's a look of disbelief in their eyes. <laughs> but anyway, the, the uh, outcome is that I get a lot of credit, for which I don't deserve. And a lot of, uh, I'm credited with wisdom, which I don't have, which is <laughs> even more embarrassing. You're anyway. unbelievably modest, David, no, honestly, no, because yeah. we knew, you, you know, you've been on the road, you produced, you know, you, from the core of natural history programming, you made it what it has become. But it's, uh, you know, another beautiful layer to you is that you're so incredibly modest. And I don't know a single member of those teams that you mentioned that doesn't 
mention you as someone who inspired them to do what they do. Um, let's talk about storytelling. We've been sharing stories for the past 10 days and it's this Oh, it's just been this beautiful, inspirational, motivational time. I certainly feel more positive and heartened from hearing all the stories. How important is storytelling as a tool to, to create the change that the planet needs? And why do you think we don't hear enough of these incredible stories that are taking place all around the world? Why are they not the news headlines? How, how much of a change do you think that would make to all of us and how we treat the planet if we change the way we tell stories and we put in the headlines all these incredible stories that we've heard about all week. Well, storytelling is the, is the basis of effective uh, communication. Um, it's very difficult to, to make us make something that holds your attention for minutes on end that doesn't have some kind of narrative dynamic in it. Um, and of course, the natural world is full of stories. Uh, um, and we would be very silly uh, to ignore that. Um, making making programs about more abstract things, about conservation as an abstract, or, or, or ecology as an abstract, is a, is a more difficult thing. But if you're going to deal with an audience of six, eight, ten million people in Britain, in the United Kingdom alone, um, and, and many, many more beyond that, um, then a, a narrative is, is, is of greatest importance. And the easiest way to construct a narrative, well, there are two. One is that I was out there and this is what happened. Uh, and the other is I was faced with a, a marvellous series of events and they are in themselves a narrative of what's going on in the natural world mm. so i'm all for stories um of course the greatest story of all is the story of evolution of, of the way in which life has developed over the last four billion years whatever it is um and i, I once tried to do that in, in 13 one hours um and I suppose that was the, the most ambitious thing I ever tried to do. That was a long time ago now, called Life on Earth. <clears throat> but it, it, it held its audience to the end because it was a narrative, because it was saying, here are, here are fish which were tempted to get out onto the land to collect insects, which were on there, and which eventually uh, developed ways of moving, and they became amphibians. Um, but they couldn't leave water very far because their skins weren't watertight. But then they developed watertight skins and they became reptile and so, and so on. And, and that held in the audience, a huge audience, that, because it was a narrative. Narrative is everything. I would like to think I could start a campaign to make such stories, um, certainly of this conservation success stories of, of this event, part of the news headlines, but I have... I think I have my work cut out for me trying to, that's a whole other transformation that needs to happen to, to make good news headlines. But I think we all yeah. desperately need it. And I do feel, oh, what a change that could create just through the ripple effect of positivity, David, right? Um, so I, I'm really fascinated by behavioral science and how we're applying that to conservation. And we know that experiences that instill powerful emotions can be really transformative and can, can you know, result in meaningful behavioral changes that, you know, even challenge the way we think about our planet. Out of your entire career, is it even possible to pick one or two moments where you were in the company of nature and the experience was so incredibly powerful, you were so moved by nature that you knew this had changed you forever and you knew that this was going to influence your career, career going forward? Can you remember any moments like that? I'm sure you have many. Yes. Yes, um, and I also um, the answer. Well, maybe it's not what you expect uh, because it's a it's a tragedy rather than anything else. Um, a second trip I did in the in the middle of nineteen fifties, I went to Guyana, which was British Guyana then. It's now Guyana, uh, and we went down the stage with. Um, a remarkable character called Tiny McTurk, 
who had um, uh, an estancia cleared out the forest and was um, establishing himself there with cattle and this and other. And he was a marvelous bushman. I mean, he knew the bush backwards. And I knew nothing of the South American forest. It was the first time I'd ever been in it. And uh, he was such a nice man. And he uh, explained to me that uh, when he was first there, he had to shoot a jaguar every day. <laughs> yes, and in order to maintain any, any cattle there at all. And, and the following morning, he said, would, would you like to go down at dawn and, and see? We've got swamps here full of egrets and spoonbills and so on. I said, yeah, that'd be wonderful. So we set off through the South American forest. And on the way, he was telling me there's a little patch of sawdust, and that's because that insect was boring him to a Did you see that bird? Couldn't you see? Good Lord, it's a plenty of birds up there. So on. And eventually, we crawled into a place where there was a little hide he had. And we looked over this marvelous swamp full of all kinds of wildfowl and geese and egrets and, and so on. And he said, um, do you see that on the far distance there? Do you see that log? I said, yes. He said, well, it's not a log. It's a caiman, which, of course, is the South American version of a crocodile. And he said, um, have you ever shot a caiman? I said, no, I've never shot anything in point of fact. Uh, and he said, yeah, take this gun. And he gave me his gun. And, and I... Foolishly, or not foolishly, innocently, I suppose. He said, aim it, just to see where it dies, just behind the eye, pull the trigger, and there was an explosion. And the crocodile, the caiman, arched into the air with a huge splash. And the entire scene was destroyed. And all the egrets and the birds and the room screamed and disappeared into the horizon. And I sat there appalled. And it was the first time I'd ever shot everything. And it was the last time I shot anything. And, and that moment of the wonder of this vast community of diverse birds and reptiles, and what I had done to it, has uh, lingered in my mind ever since. Um, and that's, of course, what we are doing to it, to the world. Incredibly personal, powerful moment and really symbolic, the way you describe, you know, how affecting one animal, the whole ecosystem is destroyed. Yes. It's all sort of rises up. How do you feel it changed you going forward? What What was the sort of predominant feeling from that experience about how you would approach everything to do with how you wanted to protect the planet going forward? How, how easy it was for ignorance um, to destroy. How complex the thing was that we were destroying. How beautiful <laughs> the community was and how we could be a member of it. Mm. Um, and of course, Tiny was a, good, was a great naturalist. I, I, mustn't, I mean, he, he had to shoot these things to survive. Uh, but we are past that now. Um, and, and we now know that, that not only is it possible to live in harmony with the natural world, but we have to live in harmony with the natural world if we are to survive. So it's not just purple prose and, and romanticism and so on. It is part of our very survival. And, and it brings me beautifully to the next question, really, because we're talking about all of these conservation successes. There is also a lot of talk about how there is a need for a deeper transformation in all of us, in how we see ourselves, our place on the planet, our relationship with it, that needs to happen to sort of support conservation and give it a fighting chance so that nature can truly recover. And in your book, A Life on Our Planet, you talk about the Amazon forest and how it self-regulates and how that's a beautiful analogy for how we can live sustainably by kind of 
using the same principles. Tell me a bit more about that, how understanding nature and how it regulates, how the planet itself, never mind just the Amazon, how that system and all those beautiful cycles, what we can learn from that about with respect to how we live on the planet. (laughs) There are elements in the rainforest um, in which we now understand that they are absolutely key to the health of the entire planet. Um, and that if, if you destroy the rainforest, you interfere with the circulation of, of, of water in the atmosphere. Um, and that, that's bad enough. But the more we interfere with the rainforest, eventually you get to a stage when, in fact, the forest itself can't survive. And people in the the area of the Amazon, when people from the north, like us, say, please don't destroy any more of the forest, they say, but that's our livelihood. We have to develop a system in which contributions by all parts of the world are recognized, and all parts of the world help to uh, support, to make sure that that crucial element within the health of the world is supported equally around the world because they're great, as we all know, great disparities. The in developed nations like this one, very powerful and so on, with, with huge influences, suddenly start telling people on the other side of the world what they have to do. We have to work out a system in which we can debate what is needed and, and, and contribute to what we uh, as, uh, have benefited so much from exploitation in in different places. And we have to consider ourselves not as separate people arguing for our own particular selfish benefit, but to collaborate in a way that has never happened in the history of the world. If only we work together, and we have to work together if we are to survive. I mean, it's not not just um, good wishing. It's survival we're talking about. Absolutely. And the message is absurdly clear now, you know, with respect to what we need to do. And and about that, actually, your your message to the the UN Security Council in February was incredibly powerful. And you made it very clear that the hope lies very firmly with what we can achieve at COP26 in November when it comes to the biggest existential crisis of our time, climate change. So, So what key actions do you think must take place at COP26 for us to succeed in mitigating the very dangerous effects of climate change? We must um, be prepared to shed uh, national interest for the international interest. Um, And that means that nations that are wealthy uh, and which have built that wealth on exploitation in distant parts of the world, have to have to work out ways in which we can uh, contribute more uh, than others that have uh, paid the price, um, and and that's going to be a difficult diplomatic one, and it's a difficult one because to get political support worldwide that the people of the world will recognize that the delegates they send to this conference are there to produce a solution for the planet and not to come back necessarily beating their chests and saying, we won, we put it over them, we got more than they did. I mean, that time is past. Um, And there has to be a a complete revolution in attitudes to the world in which nations think it's more important to get international agreements than particularly patriotic ones. Do you think we're there? Are you hopeful that key world leaders understand what you have just set out, which is, which is truth. It's, it's writ large. That's what needs to happen. Do you think we're there in time for COP26? I have no idea, really. Um, 
I, 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 I do think that it may well be our last chance. Our last chance to preserve the planet with the richness that it has at the moment, which, which in itself is already reduced. One of the most straightforward examples is, is of course, the oceans. Um, there we haven't, um, we, we should surely be able to get an agreement on the oceans. Mankind has destroyed the vast wealth of the oceans. They've destroyed the herring fishery, destroyed the cod fishery. The fact's absolutely clear. There's no argument about, about what overfishing does. There's no argument how, how, given the slightest protection, the seas can become marvelously productive. In, I mean, the idea that a, a, a single cod can produce a million eggs is, is, is very significant. And if we can only get the international agreement, we can allow that to happen. And we can bring about this enormous change in which the ocean is properly uh, agreed internationally about fishing and it becomes hugely productive and we can, food will be, which is going to be a problem for humanity, will, will become enormously enriched. Um, I mean, that's, that's a, that's a, the, the, the rights and wrongs of it are absolutely clear. The only thing that prevents it happening is selfishness. And, and we can't allow that. You, you always, as ever, set it out so clearly, so logically. It's such an obvious thing that we need to do. And as you mentioned there, selfishness tends to be an obstacle. So again, with respect to how we can create change, another very helpful tool is connections connecting with other human beings, finding common ground, having real conversations as two human beings, not two people with sort of, uh, you know, motives and incentives because they're re representing a country. And I'm curious, when you're at more challenging, um, in more challenging environments, like the COP conferences or biodiversity conferences, how do you go about making connections with world leaders or big industry leaders? Do you have a different approach to talking to someone like me who's kind of the converted. And have you ever had a moment where you've gone, finally, ah, I've made a connection with him or her. I can, I can see we're getting somewhere. Um, well, I, 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 su I suppose uh, people say nice things uh, after, after you've made a speech. <laughs> uh, the question is, uh, and it's easy to bask in uh, thinking, yes, we're changing opinions and so on. But then, Fair play, we have to think about the problems for the politicians who have just been listening to you uh, making these great sweeping statements and thinking, yes, I see the problem. Then they get back home and they have to face the electorate, the people who sent them there. And that is why an understanding by people worldwide of what the situation is on our planet is of such importance. And that's why the the business that you and I are involved in is not just trivia, really. I mean, it, uh, spreading the message about the way the world works and the wonders of the world is what we should be doing. And thank heaven, people want to know it. They're hungry to know it. And there has been certainly, in, in, to my mind, in the last 15, 10, 15, 20 years, there has been already a huge change, not just in, in, in Britain, where there certainly has been a change, but I believe it's spreading around the world. All sorts of people uh, were, uh, who were notorious for being um, quite unreceptive to ideas about natural history and so on, have suddenly become powerfully involved in it. And of course, the young people, uh, who are the key people who will be taking over the reins, they are, uh, in my view, more exercised than they've ever been and more aware of what the problems are and what the rewards are and what the compulsions are. Um, and, and those young people, when they get into power, which they will, um, I just hope that it won't be too late. And we're going to, to uh, pose you some questions from those young people. Um, 
And, and this whole event is about all of us being involved in the solution. So I'm very excited about asking you those questions. But before we go to that, can I just ask you, you mentioned there, you know, there are some countries making perhaps um, more unexpected progress um, to that end, to making the world a better place for us. Which countries are you most heartened by with regards to the policy changes they're making, not just committing to, but actually changing the way they run their countries? Well, the, 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 the clear, the clear most well-known one, uh, there may be others that I don't know about, but the most well-known one is Costa Rica. I mean, Costa Rica, putting it, um, putting it rather <laughs> simplistically, the, the people in power in politics, um, what it was, I suppose, 20 years ago or so, suddenly said, um, we are losing all our rainforests. We need to save it. How can we, that costs money. Where can we, where can we find in our budget how we can pay for that? We've got an army here. We are spending a lot of money on, on the armed forces. If America on the one hand or some great huge republic in the South America decide to invade us, well, we haven't got a chance. So that money is actually wasted. Why don't we take the money that we had in the budget for armed services and turn it into conservation areas and in promote uh, tourism and, and, and eco-tourism um, and build up uh, the, uh, the, the areas that have been de devastated and turned over. They decided to do so. And the result has been extraordinary. I mean, I, I, I recently did a, a program on, I'm making a program series on plants. And I, and I went to Costa Rica just recently to a place that I've been in I think it was 25 years, 30 years ago, exactly to that same place. <laughs> and I could have to cut my way in to get in there to where I was. And I was able to come there, stand to come there and say, look, this, all this, and it's rich, not just secondary, it wasn't, I mean, it was secondary, of course, but, and it wasn't as rich as it was, but there were a lot of birds there. There were a lot of creatures there. There was, a, it was a flourishing community. And that had been returned in, in, in the country of, 20, 20, 30 years. That, that's wonderful, wonderful. The will is there and the results are incredible if only the will is there. It's a, writ large in, in Costa Rica for sure. We have so many questions from um, our audience. So let me get straight into it. The first question, David, is from Sarah Candia. She says, thank you for all that you do to raise public awareness on such important planetary issues. How do you keep hopeful in the midst of a climate crisis and critical biodiversity loss? You have no alternative. I mean, what, do you, what's, what, what else are you supposed to do? Uh, if you really believe the truth of what you're saying, um, you know, got him flouncing off into some, <laughs> some oh. uh, you, you, there's a chance that we can fix things. Um, and I don't spend time, waste, waste time thinking, is it a 60% chance? Is it a 20% chance? What's the point? The point is you have to give whatever you can uh, to, the, to the issue, as much as you can to the issue. And whether the chances of success are 20% or 40% or 60% is irrelevant. Um, you, you, we have the chance, and those chances are disappearing. If we don't take them, we are doomed. Motivational words. I love it. Thank you, David. Now, this is a question from a young man who's clearly very intelligent, very bright altogether. His name is Henry Day. He's age seven. He's already a junior wildlife ambassador for the Wildlife Trust for Bedfordshire, Cambridgeshire and Northamptonshire. And he wants to ask you, David, I love making nature videos to show people how amazing nature is since I was inspired by your films. How do we tell people about the importance of the whole range of biodiversity and not just the cute or beautiful animals? And by telling stories, as we were saying earlier, uh, because um, when you, if it's a decent story, it's not just a hero and a heroine. Uh, it's, it's a story with a whole complex suite of background characters, some of whom are inconspicuous, some of whom are boastful, some of whom are, don't tell the truth, and some of whom are positively evil. But nonetheless, they're all there, and that story has to be told. What animals don't tell the truth? <laughs> oh, lots. 
No, I mean, uh, I, you, I, you and I both know a butterfly who sits there on the plants and say, I'm not on butterfly, I'm a leaf. <laughs> or that extraordinary snake who mimics a spider in one of your latest films. That I jumped out of my seat when I saw that. I didn't uh, know about that snake. Extraordinary. Um, just a personal question for me, you know, hearing about Henry talk about how he does what he does because of you. You're very modest, but I'd love to get a sense of how you feel, you know, throughout your career, the amount of people who say, I am fighting for nature. I want to tell stories about wildlife because of you. How does that make you feel when you're sitting having a cup of tea after a long day? Uh, well, uh, grateful, of course. Um, but but you, if, you, if you've been doing it as long as I have, okay, 1954, first time, you can do the arithmetic. That's 70 years, something like getting on that way. Um, it means that anybody uh, in this in Britain ha may have had the opportunity of seeing me when they were about four or five, which of course is the mo a very impressionable age. Um, and uh, and we, we know it about imprinting and, and one thing and another, and we know how in, how in fact you can imprint animals imprint their parents their yeah. parents are imprinted on their young and one. I sometimes think when I wonder why it is that I'm given as much credit as whether this is, this is the kind of parallel situation in which young children who are very, very impressionable uh, have listened to this, my particular voice. I ought to feel embarrassed. I do. No, you don't. <laughs> this is a, a light bulb moment for me. You are the parent that we all imprinted on. That's why whenever I watch your programs, it just feels like a warm blanket. I feel safe when I hear your voice come on the television. That's why we've all imprinted on you, David. Um, <laughs> we have a question from the Earth Optimism Nairobi team. Uh, they want to ask you, with a lot of nature being brought closer to people virtually, how do we stop future generations from becoming more disconnected from nature itself? How important is actually being in nature itself as opposed to watching it? Well, of course, it, it, um, uh, television or books or whatever are substitutes of the real thing. And you have to have a taste of the real thing. Um, I mean, you, you, I, I suppose it's possible to live without it, but, but it, to, have, to have its full effect, you, you have to... Uh, sense a real thing. Um, and we have to make it possible for people to do that. Um, and, and we are. I mean, the, the number of people, I mean, when I was a boy, the idea of going to Galapagos, it was the, it was a, another world, another world. I mean, no chance that anybody could go to Galapagos. But now, uh, people all over the world can go to Galapagos. Um, I mean, that, that's an expensive example. But, but the fact that it's there means that they value, it's possible to value that swamp, which is down the bottom of the road, more than you, more than you did. And people are becoming more well aware of, of, of what riches lie on their doorsteps. For sure, certainly with the pandemic. I know you've discussed that in the past as absolutely. well. Absolutely, mm. absolutely. I mean, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've just made a, a, a program about um, how changes have been uh, as a result of uh, of, uh, of the pandemic. There's a marvelous example of the Golden Gate Bridge, which traffic has been roaring across, you know, for 30, 40, whatever, 50 years or whatever there was, noisy traffic. And there, there's a, a, a species of sparrow there um, that nobody had ever heard. <laughs> well, there was a species of sparrow. Um, and then suddenly, the pandemic stops the traffic, the roar of the traffic falls out, and suddenly they discover that this sparrow has developed a new note in its call in the last in the last 50 years. Nobody's ever heard of it before. That wow. That's amazing. When yeah. is this program coming out, David? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be waiting with bated breath. A new note from Sparrow. That sounds so beautiful. Hmm. Um, Eve Alderson wants to know, um, as a head teacher of a primary school, I aim to try to use my position to educate the children in my care about climate change. Um, and have you any suggestions as to how we teachers can ensure our children become proactive, thoughtful and caring citizens of our precious planet? 
well, well first, there's nothing to beat first-hand um, uh, contact. The, uh, um, and, the, and the best way you can do that, or one of the most exciting ways, is actually by having a pond, if you possibly can. Uh, and there's a, a marvelous charity called Learning Through Landscapes, which, which uh, um, has dedicated itself to providing small uh, schools which haven't got, or at all, which had tarmac for playgrounds, to have, instead having a wild area with, with a bit of a pond in it. And of course, you know and I know that, that the ponds are uh, just a, a, a little bit of water, standing water, in, in spring, and you're going to get all sorts of things to that. Dragonflies, you know, dragonflies, 50 million years ago, you know, there they are. 50, what am I talking about? 500 million, well, 300 million years ago. Uh, this wonderful creature, fantastically beautiful, very difficult to observe, hauntingly difficult to observe, you know. And can I see them? And then you find out where the perch is. And so you can sit there and wait, and wait for them to go to come back. And then you see this amazing creature with its gauzy wings there, straight out of prehistory, you know, b before the dinosaurs that was fine. And they were whoppers, <laughs> you know, there, there's, there was a fossil dragonfly of the Jurassic. And, yeah, devoted to Jurassic, with, with wingspan this big. Wow, what would you make it for that? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> you, you sound 12 years old. Your passion is unending and so infectious. Do you ever tire? I mean, the way your face lit up just there is just magic. <laughs> All the years you've been, you've been doing this, communicating your love of the natural world, how is it that you never tire to tell those stories? Well, because you, you, you're never tired of seeing it. I mean... Uh, Mm. And they, they're te tantalizing dragonflies, they really are. You know, you think you're going to see it. And you... <laughs> amazing, amazing. Um, Harper and Tane Hay are aged 11 and 8. We love you, Sir David Attenborough, they say. What is one thing you believe all children should be doing right now to help save our planet? Don't waste things. Don't waste paper come to that don't waste plastic you may think plastic's awful it is awful and try and use it not at all but certainly don't waste it only use it when you really have to don't waste lights don't waste space don't waste food don't waste time just don't waste don't make that big impact on on, on the world and take more from it and, and then just throw it away Beautifully put. Uh, Sharna uh, Ambapola is 15 years old and she's learning about biodiversity and conservation through her GCSE geography lessons, um, which is great, she says, but I don't think every student gets to understand enough about these topics. Do you think conservation and climate change should be made a compulsory part of the school curriculum? Well, when I was at school, um, but, the, but the idea that science was not the ruling queen, the ruling discipline, the ruling source of insight and wonder and, uh, uh, and common sense it was foreign. Every child should know about evolution. Every child should know about how the body works. Every child should know about science, the biological sciences. I put the biological sciences first. I mean, uh, there will be those who would say, you know, physics is a basic that may be so in, in a sort of a, some, some sense or other, but, but, but certainly every child should understand about the natural world. Absolutely crucial. Indeed. I've had many arguments with some of my physicist colleagues, <laughs> uh, Professor Jim Al-Khalili and people like that about, you know, biology versus physics. And of course, I'm in the biology camp as well, David. Um, this is quite a meaty subject um, from Earth Optimism Rio team. Brazil's economy is essentially based on farming, cattle ranching, oil and mining. Sadly, many Brazilians don't believe it's possible to reconcile economic growth with nature conservation. What message would you give to these people? <laughs> well, for it to be believed, you've got to see the rationale that it, what we're talking about is truth. So what message can I say except see the way the world works? Um, I, I, I mean, you, it's an educational problem, sure. 
But um, that harks back to what we've just been saying. You've really got to understand the way the world works. And it doesn't work on petrol, it works on blood. Indeed. Indeed, everything is interconnected. It's a finite system. The, 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 the issue of infinite growth is an ongoing one. I'm fascinated by all of that. But yes, it's about fully understanding who we are and our relationship with the natural world first and foremost, on which we rely for our very survival, as you've said many times. Uh, Gitao and Elliot um, are year nine students. And they say, my friend Elliot and I were year nine. Uh, his family are Australian. My family are Kenyan. We argue about which country has the most incredible animals. What do you think? Thank you. <laughs> well, Africa has uh, more varied ecosystems than Australia, I think, does it? I mean, uh, Australia's got desert and it's got uh, temperate forest and it's got up in the Cape York, it's got wonderful tropical rainforest and it's got coral reefs. But I think probably um, in terms of variety and biodiversity uh, that uh, Africa has it. The interesting thing about uh, Australia, and w which is why I like it so much, uh, is that it's it, the cast of characters in the great drama are all new characters that you've never met before if you're a European. And that, <clears throat> that makes it very exciting to try and work out uh, who's a good guy and who's a bad guy and uh, who's the new guy. And uh, it, it, it's so exciting, Australia. Really. It's seeing, but, it's, but in terms of biodiversity, I think Africa has to have it. Fair enough. Alana Lester would like to know, what do you find to be the most useful attributes or skills for an aspiring conservationist to have? A personal close-up acquaintance with the way that animals and plants coexist. Um, um, an awareness of, of, of how seeds spring and 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 give birth to, uh, and give rise to plants, the way animals work, uh, the way the whole thing integrates, and the way that it's all interconnected. Indeed, Carolyn Cadman would like to know if you met your eight-year-old self, what advice would you give yourself at eight? Just realise how lucky you were, my dear boy, <laughs> that your parents allowed you to travel around um, on your bicycle, uh, and where it was, and you were living at the time when it was safe to do so, and when a, a twelve-year-old boy could set off and be gone for on the countryside for hours. Um, looking back on it, I didn't give that uh, freedom to my children because I lived in London. I lived in, in Leicester, uh, in the Midlands, um, and uh, in half an hour on a bicycle, I could be in fields and woodlands. Uh, and my parents allowed me to do so. Um, and so I... Uh, acquired a familiarity and interest in the natural world. What a treat, the things you experienced as a child. Um, Anthony Curia from the Earth Optimism team in Nairobi says, you are adored for your charisma and your ability to tell simple stories about nature with impact. What does it take to do this? How do we create more of you in each corner of the world? <laughs> <laughs> we need to clone you, David. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> I think the answer is, it, 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 you don't need to answer that. It's what you've kids, been doing your entire you career. You're inspiring us. The kids, the kids love it. The kids are fascinated by these things. I mean, you look at a child, just put a net in, they never put a net into, into a pond before and brings out uh, some beetles or something. I mean, they're fascinated. What on earth is that? How does it move? Why is it? move that way? Why is it shaped that way? All those questions in the in the child's mind, and you ought to be able to answer them. I don't know, the best answer, of course, is find out. Mm, mm. But um, nonetheless. Nature certainly works as magic, uh, you know, to create the conservationists of the future, but then with a little imprinting, you know, of you on, your, on our tellies, job done. 
Um, <laughs> what is, uh, Angela Johnson would like to know, what is your greatest hope for Antarctica? My hope is that, that it will remain an international, uh, an area, a remote area, in which nations get on with one another and agree with one another and deal with problems as a team uh, in a way which is a model. Uh, and um, I mean, it's been imposed that that behavior that's admirable in, in, the, in the Antarctic has been imposed upon them because it's so extremely difficult to live there at all. Uh, and you depend on one another and, and uh, you, you help one another if you possibly can. And so there's an inter there's a, uh, an, an, a Freemasonry down there, which is which is encouraging, which comes from the fact that um, uh, that it's so harsh and so difficult to live. Um, but of course, it's changing, and um, there's going to be more problems there um, as as the temperature rises. I mean, sections of the ice of the uh, the skirt of ice which surrounds the the continent are uh, uh, then there are major changes. Islands appearing that are would have in Ireland for the last hundred years or so have been part of the mainland because they were connected by ice. They're suddenly becoming separate. It's changing a lot. Indeed. Only a couple of more questions now, David. We're at the end of our session, but I'm going to combine Jacob Hodgkinson and Amanda Bodium's questions because they want to know if uh, there was an event in nature that you haven't witnessed yet personally that you'd like to witness or place a location that uh, you'd like to go to again and why? I would like to go back to a, a really pristine reef, mm. coral reef. Uh, I, um, the first time I dived on a coral reef was revelatory. I've seen, seen all these hundreds of, literally hundreds of species of marvelously beautiful species, none of which you'd ever seen before, and none, all of which were extraordinarily beautiful, and all of which were mysterious. And that's got rarer and rarer and rarer. Um, but now, well now, actually I'm not, I can't swim with, with an aqualung in the way I used to when I was pretty bad, even then. But if I had the ability, I would love to. I mean, and, and what kids have now, they have the ability and they have the equipment. And that's one of the great experiences uh, on, on this earth. One of the greatest wildlife spectacles is, yeah, the life teeming yeah. around a coral reef. You've done it a lot. I have, but I, ha I know that I've never seen them in the condition you have. I mean, luckily enough, around Heron Island, they're, they were still okay a few years ago and it was just... It was like fireworks, but I'm sure I haven't seen anything like like you've seen in the past, you know, yeah. and, and that sadden, saddens me greatly. Um, Gaia Wilson would like to know, what's the most important thing you think you've learned about the natural world? Everything is connected. Everything is connected. And if you think you can do damage in private, <laughs> you're wrong. Mm -hmm. Damage spreads. Uh, and the interconnections of the natural world, press this here and the bell rings over there. Make a, make a mistake here and the damage is over there. Make an improvement here and the, 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 the benefit will be all over the place. Indeed. Well, that's a, a beautiful end message for all of our viewers, David. It's been an absolute pleasure and an honour as ever to get the chance to just hear you wax lyrical about your incredible experiences in nature. So thank you again for joining us. Much appreciated. And uh, if you've missed any of our stories of hope or indeed um, any of the activities from the Solutions Fair, everything is on the Earth Optimism website. So please check it out. Watch things again share with your friends and family, help to inspire and enthuse others so we can create that ripple effect of change that our planet so desperately needs. Thanks for watching. Have a lovely afternoon. Thanks very much, Liz.